we we had found out that he lied about this whole S four thing, and he said that he was pressured into it by the people at IFU IUFOC uh, to include that in his story because he talks about it in the original interview, and some people called him out on it. So I started set, distancing myself from him because I was like, well, maybe some of this stuff's not real information because we're not like I, I don't find any solid evidence for this TR three B craft. Or, you know, that they did much into these programs other than the Henry William Wallace patents back in the 70s, which would have been around the same time period, I guess. Um, and maybe it, it, it there is a program, but I got the, we got the hint from some of the other people on the team that, you know, he was spreading disinformation. Ted Gunderson was, you know, he gives the, he gives the names of the military contractor, the scientists involved in, you know, those are the details that you need as whistleblowers to, to really blow the lid off programs, opening up, you know, the scientific side of this, opening up a lot of that information, uh, letting, giving people access to uh, the scientists and the information and giving a platform for that to be done. And um, I think that that's my contribution anyway towards disclosure and towards, uh, you know, the future. Have you ever wondered if your company is maximizing the return of your data investment? Are you collecting the right data required to make informed decisions? Is there more that can be learned from our data? Coyus Institute can answer these questions and help you discover the hidden value within your data sets by utilizing a well-rounded approach to data analysis. Stop leaving value behind and start increasing the return on your data investment. The next generation of data analysis has begun. We are pioneers in pattern discovery. We are Koyas Institute. I started making videos on Alien Scientist channel in 2009 and uh, talking about all kinds of stuff. And uh, I met a lot of interesting people that contacted me when I started talking about this stuff and making videos about it. And people were like, hey, you know, I, I worked, uh, I, I actually met a guy who knew Edgar Fouché because I was, did a video on the TR3B and the Riddle of the Skies stuff. And, uh, he introduced me to Ed Fouché, so I was able to get like a ton of inside information on, you know, Ed Fouché and and his whole uh, story and journey through all this. And um, we who's, called him out. Of, uh, who's Ed Fouché for people that don't know? So Edgar Fouché was a, was a guy who um, worked at Area Fifty One, and, and um, it's interesting. I, I interviewed T.D. Barnes later on. Uh, he was head of the Roadrunners organization. It's all the ex-employees of, of people who worked at Area 51. And uh, he says that, you know, Bob Lazar didn't work there at all. But I asked him about Ed Fouché, and he took him a while to get back to me. But he said, yeah, I can neither confirm nor deny that he, he worked at Area 51, which is uh, a completely different answer. And we have a, a lot of documentation. You know, he, he released his military records, showed he was stationed in, at um, Nellis Air Force Base. Um, but apparently the Area 51 is a classified assignment out of Nellis if you're stationed at Nellis. So it's it's kind of like hard to track down the actual um, military people who work there and stuff just like, uh, you know, they have their own flight terminal at, at um, I think it's McLaren Air, or McLaren Airport. Uh, oh, I forget. I forget. Who, it, what's, the, what's, uh, what's Ed Fouché famous for saying? What's he famous for claiming? So he, he um, came out in 1998 at IUFOC, and uh, Ed Fouché talked about metamaterials and quasi-crystals, which are the things you need for invisibility and um, photonic circuits and stuff like that. And he, and he also talked about uh, hydrogen crystals, like solid hydrogen being used as, as this free energy source kind of thing, which is that's out there in the literature, and people are working on it now in, in the real world. Um, but he was talking about a lot of this stuff back when it was uh, it was still pretty much classified, um, which is, you know, that's documented and on the record that he was talking about that stuff in 98. Um, and he's the first person also to talk about that TR-3B craft. Right. Which I'm not so sure about the TR-3B. Um, it's, we haven't found any, like, direct evidence for that. Well, you, you're not so sure if it, uh, you don't think it exists? What I think, what I think may, might have been right, um, there might have been a program. There, I think there was a program to to research all that um, 
rotating mercury. It sounds like an easy enough thing to do. I mean, the Nazis were apparently doing that with the Bell Project. So there's got to be like a secret project where they did that somewhere. We have the Henry William Wallace patents. He's a guy from Valley Forge, PA, worked for General Electric Corporation, uh, which made, of all things, uh, mercury vapor bulbs, you know, the, the um, lamps. So um, they would have been a perfect uh, contractor or place to uh, outsource a research project like that to, you know, a, a lab and, and industrial facilities already capable of handling large amounts of mercury. Uh, um, that would have been a, a good choice for that. So he's an interesting guy, and, and there's, uh, I think, more that needs to be dug up there and told. Um, but as far as TR3B, well, there was a TR3A that was the TR3A Black Manta. So this was a whole predecessor program run by Teledyne Ryan Aeronautical Corporation out of San Diego. And in San Diego, if you go um, east... Right above Mexicali, there's a town called Homestead, uh, California. I think, I think a home, um, I forget the, uh, I, I don't know if it's Homestead, California now. I might have that, um, mixed up. Um, let me just look it up on, uh, Google Maps real quick. Yeah, but, go ahead. But this is the, the place where they develop these triangular craft. And there's a lot of sightings out in that desert area of triangle craft during that time period which is interesting because this was the predecessor for the B2, you know, and, um, well, this is what this people think it could be though, right? Like a classified spy platform, not necessarily alien. El Centro, no, sorry, El Centro, Texas. El Centro, and this was, Texas. It's, no, it was a, this was a super quiet, it had a super quiet engine on it. And it was, uh, it was, it was a spy drone that could be flown, um, by remote control up to a mile away. And it would report video back in like eight, eight or eight or I think they upgraded it to sixteen bit video. But it was like an old, it was like a basically a video game processor in it that would have a camera on this thing that would transmit the video signal back to them at home base, and they could fly it around. Right. This low, very low definition uh, video camera, early digital video camera. So you think that might be the kind of predecessor of later developments in triangle technology or well not triangle technology goes back to the nazis and the horton brothers who who started developing wing-shaped craft right. you know we had right. ib3 and, and a whole bunch of other uh, designs too in the air force but uh um they were naturally um resistant to a uh, radar because the radar equation um for the return signal of emf uh, of a return signal for a radar is highly minimized if you don't have any vertical uh, stabilizer or fuselage sections because it's that it's that wall that your radar bounces off of so if it's just a wing it's really hard to get a radar bounce off, off of that so so they're naturally like stealth aircraft um and then you have uh the, the this whole um facility in el centro texas where they were doing uh all this research into the early building drones to basically test these airframes and then also the the technology for you know early uaps mm. uh uavs sorry uh unmanned aerial vehicles right uh, so do you think uh see this guy that was at area 51 uh what was his name the the one that had the claims about the programs working on quasi crystals and yeah so this is ed fouché uh and he actually got in touch with me through a guy who saw my youtube videos and, and right in touch Ed and and so I did a number of interviews with Ed over the years, and um and then me and Ed got in a big fight and he this was before anyone knew I was Jeremy Riss I was alien scientist and he doxed me, um and put my real name out there. Why did you do that? Why did you do that? Well, he was uh he was I don't know we had a big falling out over this uh, uh, um over we we had found out that he lied about this whole s4 thing and he said that he was pressured into it by the people at ifu iufoc uh to include that in a story because he talks about it in the original interview and some people called him out on it so i started set, distancing myself from him because i was like well maybe some of this stuff's not real information because we're not like I, I don't find any solid evidence for this tr3b craft or, you know, that they did much into these programs other than the Henry William Wallace patents back in the 70s, which would have been around the same time period, I guess. Um, and maybe it, it, it there is a program, but I got the, we got the hint from some of the other people on the team that, you know, he was spreading disinformation. 
And there was another guy on the team that like he accused of being the disinformation a- agent afterwards. And then everyone's accused that guy of being, you know, everyone's accused everyone else of being disinformation and, and the whole team just like fell apart. And, um, we had a forum, uh, that was on my website it was over the forum. It was really, uh, uh, central to the forum that we had started. And there was a lot of people on that forum sharing a lot of real crazy information and stuff. And I was there, um, trying to get threads started on important topics and stuff. And a lot of the, the threads were being hijacked with this information. You know, there was just, it looked like bot or it looked like to me, I was like, the only way I could explain it is like, this had to be like the early generation of AI chat bots that mm-hmm. they had set up a room full of these computers to just spam conspiracy forums. This was towards the end of forums as, as a, as a medium. Cause you know, people kind of fell off and stopped using forums kind of after that. Cause this happened to so many forums, uh, it's called, it's a technique called forum sliding and they would just, they would just develop AI bots to do this. And, and, uh, they'd come in and, and just dominate the forum with, Mm. crap information and, and, and nonsense and, and other stuff. So it'd be impossible to just have, have a regular conversation, um, and, or moderate it and to keep up with it either. Um, so yeah, that was like, a, I, I think one of the, um, an interesting time in cyber warfare, uh, intelligence warfare, the, the, For sure. But so, so you don't think that guy's legit dude, or do you think he's legit and maybe saying certain things that are disinformation or things he, just- he- Certain things were good, like his certain sources, you know, it, 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 with guys like this, the, the Ed Fouché is not, not a physicist. He's not an educated person. He's a guy who was inside some programs as a, a you know, a military sergeant uh, working on the F-15 flight systems and had access to some personnel and people. And uh, he dug into some things and, and he just reported what he found. Okay. So, I mean, you're, you do, you do stuff like that. You're going to find some information that's legit and you're going to, f- you know, and you're going to get thrown some red herrings and maybe some disinformation. So I think that it's possible that, you know, the TR3B stuff was, you know, woven together to throw them off the trail of the, you know, what was the TR3A program. Um, and, or maybe there was another program out there. I don't know. This is, this is, this is, I haven't, you know, gone to the facility and interviewed the people that worked out there. I assume they're all retired. I would love to be able to track them down and get the employee list from. What about um? What about Bob Lazar? You think he's legit or not? Well, we dug into Bob Lazar quite a bit too, and I started. I, I used to think he was legit back in in that time, and then Ed Fouché uh, started, you know, question making me question the story. You know, asking me like, "Well, this is not the ID badge that, that you know we used to have. The ID badge should be issued by Wackenhut." Um, which is the security director and direct, you know, that they, they do electronic badging and security for, for out there. So, uh, and then he'd have to have an EG and G, a contractor badge too, to identify him as a contractor rather than what I had, which was, you know, he, he said he had a U.S. Air Force, uh, badge, you know, like a separate one. So like he, he was able to fill in a lot of like details about the case that didn't make sense. Like, why does this thing say MJ-12? And then Bob admitted that, you know, it was a reproduction of what his ID badge looked like, had looked like, and not the actual ID badge itself. Um, and then, you know, some of the other issues. So, so, you know, we, we, we dug into Bob Lazar pretty early on and, and, um, Ed, Ed and, uh, several other people I've met through, um, Ed, Ed introduced me to another guy, uh, Dan Benker, who's in the, uh, deep in the whole, uh, John Lear camp. You know, so he knew John Lear very well and got a lot of information on inside information on the Bob Lazar case through John Lear and just knew and just been doing this a long time before about UFOs. So he knew where to find certain key information and videos and stuff. And he was able to help out a lot with, uh, you know, uh, the research into Bob. And and, um, if you get Dan Bankert on your show to, to talk about Bob Lazar, I mean, you know, it's like he knows he knows more than anybody I, I think I've ever met, um, who's publicly willing to talk about the case. Um, I have met one person that knows stuff that Dan doesn't know though, and might know, probably knows more about the case than Dan. And that's Gene Huff. So Gene Huff, um, actually responded to a few of my emails I sent, uh, like a, a year or two ago. And, um, he's been, you know, co- you know, open and had, I had a phone conversation with him once. I got, I got to get 
back in touch with him on a date. We can both uh, catch each other. Um, but he wants to come forward, but he wants to say that, you know, he believes Bob. He, he, he wants to defend, say like, this is why I think Bob was telling the truth and he wants to, you know, lay it down and stuff. So I'd like to hear, you know, I'm still open to the possibility, you know, that there's more untold, you know, information about this whole story. Um, but so far with the Bob's information, it's just like the TR3B stuff. It's like, um, yeah, we have some stuff on torsion physics maybe, or, you know, um, plasma physics, uh, MHD, you know, kind of, you know, Bob Lazar talked a little bit about MHD, claimed to have a PhD thesis. I mean, a um, master's degree, uh, and his thesis was in magnetohydrodynamics, but can't produce the ma the thesis and can't really, you know, present or speak any uh, on it to prove that he knows the subject. So if you got a master's degree in something, you should be able to like come on APAC and give a presentation of, you know, what you studied and, and what you know. Um, but Bob's, you know, presentations have been, uh, you know, very lacking on the deep scientific knowledge basis. You know, the element 115 stuff, we know that Glenn Seaborg wrote article an article in 1968 for Scientific American talking about the island of stability. Um, this is in the public domain, public sources, and it was available knowledge uh, back in back in like the 70s. And when I went to the school, I remember I used to look inside the chemistry book, and it used to have all those elements past you know um, the lanthanide series of like higher elements but it said not discovered yet but we have estimates that these you know so it's not it's just arithmetic that you add more protons you get a higher at atomic number and you can go up and up and up and up and then they just get less and less stable um as you go um, right because his claim was that he 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 was working with a stabilized version is that that was the claim yeah, his claim is that they got a stable version of this and that it was so stable that they could machine it in their machine shops and that they outsourced it to Los Alamos too, apparently, to to do some of the machining and then shipped it back. Um, I don't know why they would do that. I, it doesn't make sense because the metallurgist for the Manhattan Project <laughs> was Battelle, and that's you know uh, one of the key contractors in the UFO file. So what made me start really questioning the story is that you know, in addition to it, the fact that it's out there on Joe Rogan and in, uh, in the mainstream media. Um, you know, most people should be aware of the findings of the church committee back in the seventies that the CIA controls any, every one of any major significance in the mainstream media. And if you look back at the merger of the big six corporations that happened a number of years ago, we found that like, you know, fewer and uh, more and more of the media, the mainstream news that you're, um, digesting and receiving every day is, is held in the hands of fewer and fewer people. Um, and that is as, about as close to the description of the Illuminati as uh, you could possibly get. Um, but besides that, you know, you, you question why this stuff is so mainstream, why it's so popular. And um, it's a red herring, I believe, because Site 4 and S4, when it came out, um, Site 4, there was two places that were real called Site 4. If you if you know, Tonopah Test Range had a Site 4 which ran ECCM technologies, that's electronic counter countermeasures. So radar is an ECM, that's an electronic countermeasure. And if your radar is detecting stuff and you want to not be detected by the radar, um, you can use ECCMs to make flares, you know, um, project uh, plasma balls uh, with lasers that you can you know, as chafe, a, ch a chafe is another word for this, where they where they'd have like basically the planes would fire off fireworks. Like if you got missile lock on you and and you're in an F-16 in a dogfight, you can chafe, and um, it sends out it, it, the heat seeker will go after the uh, white phosphorus and the chafe um, for the missile. So you can uh, avoid a missile uh, with some of these um, techniques. So this is like countermeasures. Um, it's part of strategy and warfare. So um, some ECCM facility was basically a counter radar facility where they built the mock radar of the Russian radar and they were trying to figure out how to be invisible to it or counter it. And um, that was called Site 4 at Tonopah. And uh, uh, apparently his friend Jim Tagliani worked there. So he would have had some 
source of inf inside information that it was a top secret facility called Site 4, and there was some crazy stuff going on there. And so maybe that was woven into his story. There was another Site 4 at Plant 42 in Palmdale at uh, where the B-2 bomber was being made. And uh, that's a whole nother issue. Um, the order, they gave him funding for like 200 B-2s, and I think they only produced like 26 or 28 of them at the end of the program, and the rest of the money is just gone um, <laughs> into some black program somewhere. Uh, so it begs the question, if they have, you know, two top secret facilities called Site 4, why not a third? Uh, but, you know, the evidence we found so far for Papoose Lake being the location of that facility, first off, you know, doesn't have the guard shack. It doesn't have the chain link fence. We have satellite pictures going back to the 60s, so it never did. Um, during, especially not in 89 or, you know, 88 when Bob claims he worked there. So, uh the element 115 stuff came out of Bob, but it didn't come until October of 1989. He uh, he came out as Dennis in May 1989, but didn't come out with his full name or the whole science and the whole big story with that long form interview that he did in October of 1989. So also in May 1989, the Scientific American published another article on super heavy elements and the island of stability, talking about you know this prediction of a you know maybe a stable group around 114 and 115 so it's possible that he could have used that as a source for the information it's a publicly available source and it fits the time period and the timeline of the story um you know but as far as i'm aware there's no classified information or no you know information that bob's ever come out of disclosures that he's ever made um that we can definitely you know, 30 years later say, hey, we FOIA'd this or we we, we found the papers on this. Um, it, there's nothing there. It's just, uh, it's completely devoid. And and, it, and uh, I feel personally shafted for having wasted like 10, 15 years of my life researching the case to find out all this disappointing information. And then now when I try to bring that information out on podcasts like Concrete, getting so many haters and and, and um, people calling me a disinformation agent and uh, and and all sorts of things uh, from people <laughs> just for trying to share the information and the research I mean well yeah I mean like that's I mean it's the the cult side of things man like you know a lot of people just desperately want to believe in these things um I wanted to believe Bob Lazar you know I was I was super into it super into it um, do. But I've paid more attention to you and to other people that have been highlighting things and I'm sorry but you can't ignore those um, you can't ignore those discrepancies man yeah yeah I I don't know man it's it's been a difficult battle I think it's the tides turning uh, no. hopefully soon because um, a lot of people have done the research and they realize that they're starting to re research and realize but you get guys that get completely burnt out and totally discouraged uh, after they come to that conclusion. And it's like, no, that's not I like, and that's a big turnoff to them to my channel because they're like, oh, this guy's debunking my hero and the guy that, you know, well, Bob's kind of my hero too because I wouldn't have researched any of this stuff if it weren't for Bob. I wouldn't have gone down these rabbit holes and dug into the physics and found the real stuff. Like, and that's what people should be hopeful for is that, you know, there are technologies like metamaterials and quasi crystals and there's a, a photonic revolution going on with, with bridging the terahertz gap right now in our technology. And for the next generation, you know, this, this, they tell you the cell phones of the future are going to uh, be, you're going to be able to wrap them around your wrists and, and uh, they're going to be clear and they're going to run on sunlight and all this stuff. And, and these are the technologies that we have today. To develop those for tomorrow and uh so there is there's more opportunity today than there ever was and just because bob lazar didn't turn out legit doesn't mean that there's not uh reverse engineering projects going on it doesn't mean that there's not recovered ufo material somewhere that's being you know carefully hidden and stored away from you know the public and even the government's oversight and private corporations uh you know where the government cannot get a get a hold of that stuff so there's there's all that going on and um it it it, it shouldn't what i think is that there is a deeper thing is that this is disinformation that's being recycled from 30 years ago it was used to kind of deflect 
they had, I think that by 89, they had already, the cat was already out of the bag. I think 86, 87, about area 51, you know, a, lo a lot of foreign intelligence agencies were aware of it. And it was published in a couple of low key magazines, you know, discreetly, um, that you can go back and look up. I forget the name of the one, the first one that published it, but it goes back to 87 and, and Lear was into all this and he was talking about it on, on the record with George Knapp a year before Bob Lazar. And so this was public knowledge. And I think they, that I, I personally think that Bob was, you know, used to catapult this message out. I was going to say, what if it was all about the fact that, okay, people are going to start to become aware of the existence of this place so as a kind of national security smoke screen we'll now put this narrative out that it's the place where we're hiding the flying saucers and the alien bodies and that will create enough of a, a kind of noise around this area for them to be able to obfuscate what they're really doing which i think primarily was you know classified spy platform testing and things like that but I mean, I, I agree with you that there's certainly no reason to discount the idea that these retrieval programs, these re-engineering programs um, don't exist just because there may be some issues with the Bob Lazar story, because uh, there are definitely other avenues through the history, if you do your research, where it's suggested that this is something that's taken place. What do you think about um, David Grush? Um, what I, you know, I don't know because... So Jeremy Corbell on this recent, he was recently on Joe Rogan and Jeremy Corbell, Joe Rogan, and that David Grush came forward because of Jeremy Corbell and that, you know, he's like essentially the guy that he met him at this thing and, 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 and helped him come out and everything. So I went and texted Ross Coolhart to see what he had to say about that, you know, and cause this is supposedly Ross, Ross's whistleblower, uh, not Jeremy Corbell's. And, you know, he, he says, he's full of shit you know ross says corbell's you know full of shit you know so um i think corbell like over you know it inflates himself maybe he he over inflates his own position in ufology and the things that he's done uh but it, it i think that he's got a lot of his inside sources that he can't reveal or talk about i'm pretty sure they're disinformation uh and if you told us about them, we'd be able to, you know, verify those. And yeah, well, I mean, I've, I've worried about that. And I know a lot of my colleagues have worried about that as well, uh, quietly in the background. I think that he's, you know, he doesn't have a, a, a super strong background in UFO. I mean, how do you become a ufologist? So, you know, how do you become the UFO expert? I've well, I, think he, I think he's extremely eager to be, you know, giving this information out and speaking about it publicly. And he's, he's, he's very much pro transparency on the subject but that doesn't mean that you can't be uh, manipulated by people that are giving you information and you might trust them a little too much just because of their backgrounds and i do think that's a real worry it's happened to me i've had people reach out to me that i've later in life realized you know well that person was full of shit but at the time i got all excited because they were giving me a kind of a, a background that appeals to you when you're doing this type of research it happens to everyone and, uh, and I don't think Jeremy's beyond that either. Uh, whether or not he would admit to it is another question because they've brought up some pretty questionable cases over the last year or, you know, last two years um, that people have found issue with. And so, you know, are they being used as a way to disseminate disinformation, even if they're doing it unwillingly? Exactly. And uh, the CIA operates that way. They would rather use people that our vehicles that do it unwittingly and that's the whole terminology what they call a uh, ace officer versus an agent and you, you don't have to work for the cia to be a cia agent all you have to you, you people who work for the cia are case officers and what case officers do, officers do is they discover and manage agents um through manipulative uh you know, sort of clandestine and discreet tactics. So it's just, it could be just befriending them under a false profile and be like, Hey, Jeremy, I love what you're doing. Let me give you $10,000. Keep talking about this, this, and this, and you, and I'll keep funding you. Well, I mean, I don't know. I don't know who's, I don't know if he's receiving any sort of, you know, funding, but it's just, uh, it's certainly easy to, if you're a very eager and excited about a subject, it's very easy for someone to kind of get in there and, and manipulate the way that you talk to people, especially if you're a public persona and I just think that people obviously recognize if they're doing their research in this field that it's decades of psychological operations and, and disinformation on this. It's been uh, permeating the subject this entire time. 
to think that that stopped now would be really weird. It's obviously carrying on now. There's still going to be psychological warfare. It's going to be a little bit more sophisticated. And and I just don't see how you could look at the narratives and the process that's unfolding in government right now and not imagine that there may be things happening in the background that you don't know about and uh, that it's all just squeaky clean. It's a nice transparent disclosure. They're trying their best to get, you know, information and answers. That's the, there's, there's just no way that this could be handled transparently by this structure. So the thesis is, you know, now being presented as Jeremy Corbell and his evidence, where the antithesis is now the Congress responding to the UFO community, which isn't anybody else besides Jeremy Corbell. He's the only one, of course. And so we have to focus on everything that Jeremy Corbell's put out. Then they debunk all that. That's the antithesis. And the synthesis that they're hoping for is not disclosure. The synthesis that they're hoping for is actually um, where Congress will be so fed up with the subject and the bullshit they, they ch- uh, red herrings they've been chasing for the past year that they're going to say, we're not going to look at this for another 70 years again. And it's got so if, if that if that really was the process, who's the they in in that scenario? So that would be the intelligence agencies like the CIA that were set up after Roswell specifically for that purpose, <laughs> you know, uh, and with that goal and objective in mind, um, on the behalf of the banking and um, financial communities. So that the ba- banking and financial interests work with the military industrial complex, you know. They work with uh, the oil and uh, gas and energy industry, the Atomic Energy Commission included in that, uh, with with uh, other fuels, and they and they work with uh, drugs and drug cartels. This is documented. So, in, with gold, oil, and drugs, and God we trust. This is um, sort of the the plan that's existed, <laughs> the cancer that's existed on our society since Eisenhower warned us about it before he left office. Because there's so much other stuff that people need to realize that UFOs is connected to when you start really digging into it. And I, I went on a Dark Horse podcast and, and debated Michael Shermer on a lot of that stuff. Yeah, that was great, by the way. Really great. Thank you. Uh, and again, you know, my expert that I've been learning the JFK stuff from is, is Mark Grober of America's Untold Stories. Uh, and so I suggested, hey, you know, Shermer said his experts... Um, Gerald Posner, who, who wrote Case Closed, you know. So I said, why don't you get Gerald Posner on to debate uh, with, you know, Mark Grober? Because these are, that's my expert and his expert, you know. So, like, we'll get those guys to come on and debate. That would be just strictly JFK. And <laughs> that would be something to watch, huh? So, um, yeah, Mark, Mark Grober's claim that he's going to, uh, I mean, sorry, Gerald Posner claimed that he's going to re, re, uh, release case closed with an added chapter to address all this stuff and and uh you know i kind of was like uh have you have you really looked into all the stuff that's come out in the last 30 years since you published your book because you're going to need a lot more than one chapter right <laughs> yeah this is this one is is turning it around and we as we look into jfk we realize what was the cia doing in that you know that decade and a half from roswell to jfk and when you start filling in a lot of those holes, um, you start seeing, wow, they were like really out of control with uh, a lot of stuff. And, you know, when JFK found out about the Bay of Pigs and the um, Operation um, Northwoods, Operation mm-hmm. Northwoods, yeah, yeah this is 1961 Operation Northwoods plan, um, which is very similar to 9-11. When he found out about those two plans, he kind of... Um, was like we get we he wanted to shut the CIA down. It was really going after. He fired Dulles and he fired um, Cabell, and Cabell's brother was the mayor of Dallas. So Dallas was picked as the spot for all that, and the rest is history. Uh, you go to America's Untold Stories if you're if you're interested in learning about that because that guy that guy has done his research. Yeah how how much of it do you think do you think any of it had anything to do with the UFO file? Because he was interested and he was... Oswald was in New Orleans working for Guy Bannister for the Free Play for Cuba Committee and, and right. at 454 Camp Street, New Orleans. That's Guy Bannister's office. Guy Bannister is the FBI agent who created the X-Files. Oswald is directly connected to the UFO file. It's it's It couldn't be more connected. 
In fact, that the same the same CIA unit that set this all up is the same one that's held on to these secrets. It's the same people that created the CIA um, in forty seven. You know, to cover up all cover up a lot of this stuff. How deep do you think it really goes with the black technology, man? Like, if you really have we to got your best assessment. Yeah, we might have alien stuff that's been we've been sitting on trying to figure out. We bring it out every decade to get a a, a science. We'll pick like. 12 scientists and get them to like have a peek at different parts of it and 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 try to see what we can figure out from it that's what i think it's some something like that honestly it's got to be it's got to be something crazy like that because where did all the where did a lot of these things come from yeah you can say they had you know human origins and and we we tracked them down but some of them some of them like the quasi crystals thing i still don't know uh daniel sheckman did his post doc at right pat and then that's when he Invent, that's when he made the discovery of quasi crystals. So um, it's uh, it's quite uh, it's quite interesting uh, that some of the connections that we, we might not know about uh, still behind the scenes. Uh, Night and all wire is another one that's always fascinated me. That, that why did we start doing all this research in titanium and shape retention alloys um, right after the Roswell craft? With all those people were reporting that foil that did all that weird stuff. What do you what do you think of the Corso hypothesis? You know that these things have been subtly integrated into society through innovations that we just think are human, but turns out there was some influence. You know, I I, I think it it's the research is still going on. I mean, I did a lot of research into some of the things for you know he's talked about, and I've traced back a lot of the human origins for a lot of things. You know, fiber optic cables, for example, the Romans knew that you know light would travel through the uh, a water spout, like you poke a hole in the side of a barrel and let the water pour out. The light will travel inside that like a tube. So they knew it would, like fiber optics, uh, you know, total internal reflection was a thing inside of fiber optic cables and also water channels and stuff like that. So they understood that, um, you know, they they understood you know. So some of the stuff you, you, that he claimed I could trace down. But um, like I said, the night and all wire was probably the one thing that he claimed that I, I was really, you know, I'm still kind of curious about, you know, what what naval ordnance labs knew about uh, this technology and what they still might know. Um, curious that I asked Richard Doty whether he thought uh, we should subpoena the head of material command and the head of, you know, naval ordnance labs to testify about whether before Congress about whether or not they really have alien technology and hold on to this stuff because uh, i you know that's kind of was the angle i was taking it and dodie's like oh that's not going to do anything and they shouldn't have those people testify which i don't know that that i'm still skeptical of dodie i don't know i don't i don't know what to make of him man he's uh he's an interesting character man and you know he he was with the the falcon the a the aviary aviary there was yeah. the falcon and um, yeah something like that some uh some bird related title i had a had a cocktail with him at a conference. He's a pretty interesting guy to talk to, and he's friendly. But yeah, I don't know, man. Counterintelligence and uh, anyone who comes from the world of of kind of like disinformation ops and and uh, stirring the pot, I have a trouble, you know, believing entirely. I do too, especially you know the people I like is when you you know whistleblowers, like real whistleblower, like Ted Gunderson from the FBI, for example. Are you familiar with Ted Gunderson? I'm not. Ted I'm Gunderson. Not Ted Gunderson's the guy that told Alex Jones about Epstein Island, you know. Ah, uh, uh, that guy. That yeah. guy. And um, Ted Gunderson was, you know, he gives the he gives the names of the military contractor, the scientists involved, and, in you know, those are the details that you need as whistleblowers to, to really blow the lid off programs. And because at me as a researcher, if you're like Jeremy Corbell and you're like, oh, I have classified sources and I can't tell you, but I heard this, this, and this, and, and there's no scientific intel, no, there's no meat and potatoes for a, a term that I can go look up now, like spatiotemporal optical vortices or, 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 or um, magneto hydrodynamics. Uh, you know, there's no, there's no thing that I can go and look up to go find out, well, who, who wrote about this in Google Scholar and, and is, is, you can't find the scientists, contractors, you know, that it's not a real, it's not a real black op. It's not a real SA special access program. It's not, a, it's not, you're not digging up real secrets and not finding real information. You know, for example, um, 
I, I was able to confirm that there was something to this terahertz stuff because one day I found a contractor that had been arrested. And uh, this is an interesting case because when the contractor was arrested, um, this guy was a, a, wor a researcher at a university. And the original newspaper article story claimed that he had been um, growing marijuana plants and that they had sent the DEA there to, to go and look for a marijuana grow at his, at his residence. Um, but that first story turned out not to be true and there was no DEA there. It was actually the Air Force OSI and they weren't there looking for marijuana plants. They were looking for uh, classified documents. But they had told the newspaper that originally so that they that is disinformation to, the, to make a false report. Now, compare that to what Jeremy Corbell did in his film on Bob Lazar, where he spent the first you know, 10 or 15 minutes hyping up that FBI raid, okay, saying that the FBI raid on, on United Nuclear was for Element 115 and, and looking for Bob's Element 115, when in fact, we, we later find out from the FBI that there was only FBI there, there was no Atomic Energy Commission people there, there was no you know, nuclear... Uh, squads there. It was only FBI and they were looking for thallium um, because you know, a nuclear cells of all things thallium uh, which some, someone uses. See, like, I, th I think that makes sense to me but a few people would definitely argue with well, actually that could be the cover story right? That we wanted to go see the thallium yeah. but actually we're looking for the 115 just like the other Air Force story. The thing is that they, Jeremy Corbell never proved that or ne and he never he never got the warrant you know, because we found the war, we, we, we other researchers, I think uh, it was Steve Camby and Truth Seekers that went and got the actual police report and the warrant and, um, and everything. And we can, so, you know, Corbell didn't do that. He's, it's not real investigation. It's, it's poor journalism. Um, and he, it's just over dramatized because if there was evidence for that, it, he should have presented it. And otherwise, why even mention it or waste time, wait, waste people's time on it? I mean, it's just, um, but anyways, back to the other contractor that I found, um, in, uh, Fairborn, Ohio, he ended up doing a year in, in a federal prison for bringing documents home. And it turns out that he did his PhD thesis on terahertz, uh, technology and was working for, um, the ultra fast photonics and terahertz research group. Uh, there at the university. So it, it proves that there is you classified Air Force, you know, intelligence work being done into uh, terahertz wave technology. Well, this is something that I wanted to talk to you about is the, um, the whole LK-99 uh, superconductor, because I think this is a pretty interesting situation. And I know that you guys have been working on essentially like their models trying to replicate things but could you give could you give people a bit of an idea because not everyone knows this kind of stuff can you can you give people a bit of an idea of why superconductors are important and what their function is and uh, and why something like room temperature superconductivity would be such a big deal the first superconductor that was ever uh, discovered was actually mercury they supercooled mercury and found that it turned superconductive so that was the first time they discovered superconductivity is by a scientist by the name of meisner and uh that's who the meisner effect is named after so if you were able to create a you know a superconductor the problem is that you have to keep it super super cold and that takes a ton of energy so um the amount of energy that you save you know in transmission costs over long distances uh, you don't get back when you have to pump all that energy in to take the heat out and to super cool it. So there's there's a certain point where you have an energy trade-off. So if you had a, something that's super conductive at room temperature that doesn't require you to put all that extra energy into it, it's it's just naturally super conductive. Um, that's going to be super cost effective to all our all our uh, infrastructure. We're going to be able to have lightning fast communication and power without losses. Is basically what you'd have. Um, it would, you know, revolutionize a lot of our infrastructure if you had a room temperature superconductor. Um, now they make superconducting wire. They're making six thousand miles of it currently for the I ITAR reactor project over in uh, the, the um, fusion reactor. So they need these superconducting wires to make super magnets. Um, superconducting super magnets can produce really high magnetic fields 
and you need those super high magnetic fields to get nuclear fusion going. So this is um, what they're doing currently at ITAR. So uh, if they were able to make those out of something else other than you know YCBO, which needs to be cooled to about seventy Kelvin uh, or one hundred and seventy Kelvin, uh, you could if you could get something that you didn't have to super cool, it would be a lot more cost effective and it would it would also give you power gains and stuff um you know so what, so what's the story with it with lk99 what what happened here so lk99 is an interesting story it, what it looks like happened is uh, um someone might have published a paper under the scientist's name i don't think it was actually that i think one of the scientists came forward and says that they didn't published these actual this actual paper and it was a false pre-publication study so it wasn't a peer-reviewed study but when it came out it went it went sort of viral across the internet because people were like oh room temperature superconductor and and uh here's you know the ability to replicate it was pretty easy you could just use you know lead oxide and and some red phosphorus and it had a couple you know low costs easy to get reagents and uh so groups across uh the internet and started, you know, taking up, um, trying to replicate the results and make some of this stuff. And, um, thanks to a couple hoaxes, uh, I think it, it, the excitement grew even wider because a couple of people made fake videos, you know, showing levitation and, and other things. And those got more, more interest in the, in the subject. Um, and we had just gotten a vacuum furnace uh, for another project and, and some, we had all the lab equipment pretty much to do this on hand. So, um, we actually made some lanarkite glass and then, and then baked it up into, uh, you know, the LK99 and we got some, we got some pieces that looked like they had paramagnetism or diamagnetism. They were, they were acting really funny in a magnetic, under the magnetic field and the magnet when we first pulled them out under the microscope. And I put that video out. And uh, showed that, you know, this piece here, and then we actually had a piece of an iron filing that was following the magnet around, and you could see the other piece of our um, LK, LK99 crystal wasn't doing that. Uh, but it still wasn't loading, it wasn't, you know, locking and trapping, you know. So um, we had to, uh, we, we, we wanted to do some more experiments, so we went and we did an SEM uh, imaging on it, so scanning an electron microscope to kind of give, give a, a whole el elemental background too on what's what it contains to see maybe first thing i wanted to look for was iron impurities because if you have a little bit of iron impurity inside that chunk of, of your crystal um it can cause it to act like a paramagnet you know like kind of like a compass needle or something so that m might be contamination that that's causing that so um we're still waiting to get the full results back from the sem it's been a, a lengthy process. The guy who, who did it for us was kind of doing it in his spare time. So he's got to like coordinate that between actual work and research projects on that machine. So um, we're waiting to be hear back from him on that. And um, in the meantime, we've kind of lost interest because the, the the facts that came out about, you know, the, the original author claiming that it wasn't his paper and that these people had, you know, made up this group, including the address, which some other investigator went to that address and found that it's like some basement apartment building in, in, in South Korea and not like a real lab and stuff. So, um, well, yeah. yeah, there's been, yeah, it's, it's a weird story, but you know, then again, you like, we were just, I don't, as a scientist, I'm like, well, let's just read the paper and the results. We'll, we're going to try to replicate it as best as we can. And maybe, you know, we're not going to, we're not going to do what some of the other papers did is they just took that paper, which is translated from South Korean and replicated it exactly without, you know, using their assumptions on the parts that weren't clear and just immediately reported their results, you know, like just exactly as is. And that's nothing wrong with that. Um, but they we mentioned it there's there's might be a little bit of finesse in the formula maybe the people who invented this didn't release the whole formula maybe there's certain things to make it work better that we could we could tweak um so we what went through a lot of trouble of working with some of the other material scientists in the other groups out there to try to um improve on the formula and answer a lot of the questions you know that guys like um uh, what's his name that was doing a lot of the replications 
I forget his name. The the guy who was doing all the all the replications um, early on. But the, but the te- the tests that you were running were they producing effects that were novel effects he didn't expect or just byproducts that weren't that interesting. Yeah. A couple of those samples that showed the paramagnetism and showed a little bit of weird magnetic effects. So there is that. There is some paramagnetic pieces right. that right that discovered in this, and I think that might have um, confused or threw some research groups off. Uh, but we haven't been able to grow a big enough crystal. Um, for one, we we have a, a facility. It's I can't run that vacuum furnace at the place we are right. our current ability. I can't run it overnight. I have to be there watching it while it's running. So we can only do like an an eight hour run because I'm not doing more than eight hours at, at work. You know, the, I could maybe do a twelve hour run. But what yeah. we wanted really to grow a large crystal is to to run a batch for like four days, and we can't currently do that where we're at. So there might be other groups working on that. We we've got right. enough information out there about our replications to help. Um, other groups with their ability to, you know, improve on that formula. So, hey, if if there is a big cover up and someone just made up all that that other stuff to discredit it, um, then we'll know for sure with the science because you can't, you know, if it works, it works, and if it, I don't know, it's inter- it's interesting. I mean, like, do you think innovations like can't trust that? That line of information, though, a lot of people would have hung up their research right there and been like, oh, that's that. Then, then we don't have to look into this and it's fake. But like real science isn't about that. It's about, it's about right. trying to replicate the results. And, and Right. If you think things like this, um, room temperature, superconductivity, cold fusion, do you think breakthroughs like that have been suppressed? It, if there's an incentive to suppress, then, then yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's definitely an incentive if they've created it, right? Because it's incredibly sure. powerful technology example in cold fusion uh Husienga was one of the top fusion scientists and he wrote the most damning book that was the you know debunk the two coup de gras for cold fusion back in the day and a lot of people have argued that you know Husienga um was had a conflict of interest because you know cold fusion posed a threat to the all the funding that the hot fusion community was getting and you know he he actually managed and ran one of the biggest hot fusion labs at the time and um so there was a, you know this argument that you know of course he's got you know conflict of interest he's you know trying to it's like the the big candle again yeah i mean if there was a if there was an innovation like that i'm sure there'd be uh, elements of suppression do you think that the um i mean one of the one of my favorite stories i mean it's a sad story obviously because the guy died but um, I always wondered if there was truth to it, which was the uh, the Stanley Myers hydrogen fuel cell engine, like the toroidal engine. How about that? Um, what was the security guard that I covered too? He was working on the same Stanley Meyer, you know, fuel technology. Right, right. Security guard that got shot from that, like um, that mass shooting event that people were at. What was when the hell was it that? It was Michael something or other. I, I covered that guy and went and we tried to, I tried to watch some of his videos and get into it. Um, but again, it might've just been a coincidence that, you know, he was into that stuff and, and got, you know, he was the, that kind of mentality where he was going to save the world with free energy technology, but he's also going to save all those people from that mass shooter. You know, it takes a certain type of person, you know, uh, yeah, I can kind of, uh, uh, but you know, like, you can tell like who's who who's the type of person that's going to stand up for you and and like that kind of situation and and really handle business and who's going to cower down and not you know it's be like oh well you know someone else, let someone else do it you know mm-hmm. um kind of idea uh so yeah i guess he he i don't have any information on the water cart technology other than that geet the geet engine and there's a couple other people that have uh worked on this and developed it um who was the the guys that were at tesla tech that i covered um last year not this year but the year before there was a group there working on the geek technology and and this these apparent ways to you know you're electrolyzing water yeah turning it into oxygen and then combusting it again and supposedly getting more energy back than you do from separating it and um but I guess some of the problems are in, in um, the, the the actual machines itself. Uh, 
that claim the efficiency losses are due to like a hydrogen leaking out because of improper storage. So they were going to, you know, graphene lined um, tubing so that the hydrogen can't escape. And then the, uh, of course, the the corrosive of the oxygen and other things uh, on some of the, the wear and tear on some of the parts in these machines are, are problems and stuff. But yeah, as far as that goes, um, we have a laboratory available um, in New Jersey and in, and up here in Massachusetts, you know, um, and we'd be happy if you have a technology that violates the second law of thermodynamics and you can prove it. Um, I would love to verify that and, and look at it. Um, we might try to hold an event like that, like once a year where we have like uh, a challenge, you know, like an open challenge for people. Of course, there, there's all kinds of prizes for people that can prove this too, that are out there. Um, you know, the anti-gravity prize that was just put out by, uh, by that guy, um, Lincoln labs and stuff. I was talking about it that I, I covered a couple months ago. Um, but anyways, this, this, if people have that technology, I would love to be the one to help prove that out and expose it. And we have forums for this kind of stuff as well for people that, you know, we have APEC open mic where anyone can just get on and, and share information. And, um, we have a lab facility where we'd love to prove out these things. I mean, we, I know a guy personally down in uh, Pennsylvania and he's got a warehouse Oh God, I wish I could show you this video. Oh God, I I don't think I can, I'm allowed to, but he's got a warehouse full of Bedini motors and uh, free all these free energy like things that he's built and tried and and over the years and and he's just an expert with all that stuff. But um, nothing, as far as I, I know, has proven to get you know limitless free power from nothing. And, and there's no like proven violation of the second law and i would love to see that and you know it's it's very disappointing law of physics um that we can't get energy from nothing and there's no free lunch uh i guess but a lot of these things do work on some ways to harvest energy from environmental sources you know because i guess the second law of thermodynamic relies on um, the assumption that you you have a closed system, but in nature, there's really no such thing as a closed system because we're all entangled, um, and there's always losses or or um, entanglement with other things um, in any sort of situation. So uh, the idea is that maybe we can harvest energy from ambient sources or well that's why i mean like obviously the technological capabilities needed to do it is a different question but do you think it's feasible to pull energy out of the ambient quantum vacuum and that could be the infinite source of energy so there might be a way to do it right and it would have to be in quantum mechanics and quasi particles and and sort of these these interactions um a lot of these 2d membranes are have physical environments that are not well documented and not well understood by the current literature and i think if it exists it exists somewhere in there you look at guys like uh daniel sheen professor daniel sheen he's working on a bipolar um, membrane device which creates a ph gradient um across it and he's getting energy from it and we have uh that we were actually working on that project at our lab currently and we're going to be doing like a Hackaday prize contest for that project as well, which I'm, I'm going to help out with the video on that for. Um, but yeah, there's a, there's a lot of people working on these ideas and, uh, with, you know, good physics and good, good, uh, ideas for how to, how to do this. Uh, um, but as far as, uh, you know, using this as energy sources, there's tons of energy sources all around us. So like cold fusion, for example, um, there's enough, uh, there's more power in a cup of, there's enough, you know, enough, there's enough, um, power and energy in a, in a cup of seawater to boil all the world's oceans. If, if you were to have the fusion energy and turn that mass into, in, into energy through e equals MC squared, right? So you could boil all the oceans of the world and just the energy inside one cup of water, um, accessing that and figuring out how to do it and release how to release that is, is another problem because it's like um again it's it's deeper physics that we still have to uh we're you know as advanced as we think we are right now and as much as we think we know um 
I think we're only at the start of uh, where we're going. Where we're yeah. Going. Well, I mean, that's that's the stuff we have to. You have to wonder. You know, have they have they done it in the black with trillions of dollars of black money and uh, a lot of time on their hands, or are they just grappling with it quietly and wasting a lot of money while they do it? Well, we know that Spaywar and the U.S. Navy labs uh, did a lot of cold fusion re- research, and they actually were able to confirm cold fusion. They found they showed tritium uh, samples in their um, in their results, and I actually got to meet um, Larry Forsley at MIT when he came in 2014, and he's he was a scientist who worked on that project. That was uh, interesting. I didn't really get to sit down directly to talk with him, but I was like with a big group of people afterwards out to dinner where I got to sit and listen to him, you know, argue cool. with a bunch of the people that actually knew they were talking about. So, do you have any, um, you got any hope for a presidential candidate that might actually handle this issue? The UFO issue, the corporate cover up issue, anyone that's in your sights? Um, RFK Jr. is the only one right now that, that I see having any chance of, you know, getting to the bottom of any of this. And only because, his, you know, he's raised the issue about his uncle and his and, and his father's murders, um, which, as we talked about earlier, are directly connected to the, the UFO file. Um, so as, if he digs into that, uh, he's going to... Uh, yeah, he's going to get some inf- some information out, and yeah, and it's, we, I saw you put up a tweet about him. Actually, do you think he's got a chance? It's hard to say with the control that they have over the media. You know, I talked to my dad. I was like, "Oh, what do you think about RFK?" And he's like, "That guy's a complete idiot." You know, and I was like, "Oh, well, you know, you know, they did like a four hour interview with them and chopped up about you know one minute worth of right. material." Right. Um, the way it worked. It's how it's it's conf- it's it's going to be a difficult puzzle. But if he could go after the deep state, you know, the people that killed his father and his uncle, um, and we can oust those people and bring them out, that's best chance of bringing the UFO file out and getting to the bottom of all this that we ever have. I mean, um, I don't know, unless anyone's got any better ideas or a a, a plan B. You know, it's a crazy system. Uh, I don't know if we'll be able to vote our way out of all the problems. I don't think so. It's, uh, I don't know if government is the ultimate answer or solution to our problems. Um, Well, so much of it's corporate now, so much of it's corporate control, you know? I I think, uh, you know, JFK had it right when he said, you know, you, you know, don't ask what your country can do for you, but ask what you can do for your country. And, um, you know, it's it's really about us stepping up to do something for our country. And I hope that, you know, my work with alien scientists has, you know, brought a lot of this disclosure along further because op- opening up, you know, the scientific side of this, opening up a lot of that information, uh, letting, giving people access to uh, the scientists and the information and giving a platform for that to be done and um, I think that that's my contribution anyway towards disclosure and towards, uh, you know, the future because we need to figure out what works, you know, to teach people science, but also teach the new generation and the young next generation that, you know, you can be interested in science because it's not just all boring crap. Yeah, there's a lot of stuff that you have to learn, but look at all the cool stuff that you'll be able to do with it, you know, once you, you know, struggle through your high school stoichiometry, uh, chemistry homework that may seem like it's pointless and boring right now. But in the future, when you want to make, you know, graphitic carbon nitrate or, you know, some of these other things, you know, hexagonal boron nitrate or some of these other things you're going to need to build UFOs or, or whatever you, you want to build in the future, you, you're going to damn wish you uh, paid attention and had that knowledge. So um, I think it's, it's, a, it's, a good, uh, it's a good place for you know, Americans to realize that, you know, we're, we're, we're at a turning point in uh, our evolution in our history. And, uh, we can eat, we're, you know, we got our hands on the, since the cold war, where we have our, uh, you know, a finger right on the button, you know, imminent global self-destruction, um, at any moment in time, we could, or we could work together to build, you know, incredible things and, and, uh, make sure that, the human race doesn't ever end because 
you know, all, right now all our eggs in one basket. All it takes is one asteroid to wipe out uh, this one planet that we, and, and, and that's, the human race isn't anywhere else. We don't have a Mars base. We don't have a moon base. Um, we don't have any space stations that, you know, we can live on long term and, and really get off, you know, we'd be, we'd be done. So this is our, our home. We need to take care of it. Um, and we need to really plan for the future and, you know, think outside of this sort of, um, banker mentality where our only goal is profits and money and, um, a, you know, strategic conquests and objectives, you know, uh, control of resources, you know, why are we fighting over resources on this planet when we could be mining asteroids and there's just infinite resources in space? We get massive solar panels set up, uh, you know, we could have energy generation in a Z machine, we could make pretty much anything that we wanted, um, just with the, the amount of energy that we had and the elements and materials available in space. 